Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, your afternoon sunset safari. This is an elephant. Well, that is an elephant. My name is James. Brian's on camera, and you are watching Safari Live. Just over there, everybody, a little elephant that is seemingly stalking us. He's just hiding under the shade there. Now, while he's there, just to enjoy him, and I'll tell you that you are on a live safari, so please do send us questions. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv on the email if you want to talk to us. It's a beautiful afternoon here in the northeast corner of sunny South Africa. Sunny for the moment. 24 degrees Celsius, apparently. That's roughly 71 degrees Fahrenheit. And there are probably about six or seven elephants around us. One of them's just walked past the back of us. So silently. You almost can't hear him. It's a young bull. I think these are the same chaps that we spent quite a lot of time with yesterday afternoon, Brian and I. On the other vehicle, the Duke of Sydney, Hayden Turner. He is currently trying to find the lions that were seen today. Astonishing sighting Jamie had of the lions fighting with each other. But just try and get a sense of the unbelievable piece of this. Or two starlings in the background. Otherwise, all is silent. Very, very peaceful afternoon. Isn't that nice? Look at this little chap who's just probably, what, Brian, about 10 meters from us, 30 feet or so. Now, of course, you do know it is Olympics at the moment. The Olympics are on in Brazil. If you didn't know that, you've had your head buried in the sand for some time. Um, and we had our own Bush Olympics today. Of course, I will give you the results of the six events that were held today during the course of the afternoon. First uh, event that was held was the shot put, or the elephant dung put, as it was today. I opened up the account with a what I thought was respectable throw. I didn't end up on the podium at all. Brian, uh, you took the podium position there, didn't you? You, you took gold in the elephant shot put with an impressive throw of about 500 meters. There is Brian's Olympic thumb to show his celebration of his exceptional performance in the elephant dung put. Well done, Brian. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. good job. I'm going to try and move a little bit forward and see if we can't get a slightly better view. This chap is very close to us, but he's right in the middle of a thicket. They're talking to each other now. I think there's been an order given. No, no movement. Let's just sneak a little bit forward. There are quite a few elephants around here. Shame. All right. While we find another good viewing position for these elephants, let's go across to Hayden and find out how his lion search is progressing. Well, welcome, folks. Great to be with you again uh, this afternoon. My last uh, drive for this little visit, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Goodness me, I've had a good time. It's been amazing to work with the team again and be in this magnificent location. Uh, my name's Hayden Turner. If I've never met you before, lovely to meet you. If I have met you before, great to be back with you and welcome to Safari Live. If you've got any questions, please send them to us at either Twitter, uh, you can tweet them at hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. So I'm here with Jandre today uh, for my last drive, which is absolutely brilliant. 
And we just thought we'd come across uh, this morning was an absolute smorgasbord of activity. There was the calmness of the elephant herd and the breeding herd all around us this morning and all that action with Jamie and also, of course, the bushwalk. And we did that little... Uh, Little cross to schools this morning in uh, New South, the state of New South Wales, Australia. We had just uh, under a thousand kids watching. It was just brilliant, and uh, we've got amazing feedback. They all had a brilliant time. So thank you very, very much to everyone that was involved. Um, so we had a, we, it was elephantastic for us this morning. But being International Line Day yesterday, and I didn't see one proper. I just thought I just asked the guys. I said, would I be able to go and try and find some lines? Well, I don't know where they are. Can you see any, Jandre? Oh, there we go. There's one right there. Oh, actually, there's more than one. There's two. There's three. There's four. There's actually quite a lot. How fantastic is this? They are all resting. They're all flat. And you know what? It's absolutely fine. I'm so fine with seeing flat cats. They are just magnificent. And these boys, this is a Birmingham boy. I am not, so maybe you could help me if he does look up, but I doubt he's going to look up. If you can recognize which particular individual this is, please tweet or email and let me know. i just tell you a little story about these guys. Uh, the Birmingham boys, when I first met them, was up on, they were, they were just coming into uh, females, just put his head up, her head up over there, but she's about to lie down as well, I think, at the back. She's just looking at us, and she's cool. She's, they're very relaxed, and they're very used to us, so completely undisturbed by us. Didn't even raise their heads, the females, when we, when we drove up. And uh, I first met these five, when there was five boys before uh, our scrapper uh, left the, the great savannah uh, and bush. Uh, there was five of them, and I met them on, I think it was in Parlour Plains or Sandy Patch, Liam and I came around the corner one day and there was these three young boys uh, who'd just come in to the area and they weren't very vocal but uh, they were definitely looking fantastic and I had a few interactions or encounters with them and beautiful sightings over that time. And then, you know, everyone here or most people that are listening that are regulars uh, uh, know the story and are really up to date with all the all the movements and all the different uh, encounters that these animals have had with uh, faintly incohumas and other lions. But uh, it, it's just great to be back with them for me. I try and keep track with them as much as I possibly can uh, by reading, you know, the Facebook updates. And you know what the interesting thing is? You guys, when it's someone like me coming back for a short stint and I haven't been here, you guys are the experts when it comes to the social interactions and the history of them. So. Uh, I'm not going to try and go into the history, but for first-time viewers, if there is anyone watching, which I hope you are, uh, and welcome if you are, um, these boys have risen to uh, a successful sort of dominancy in this area. Things will change over time, but it, at the moment they're, they're, they're sort of fragmented. They, uh, they sort of come back in and out, and line social activity is, is very complex, particularly when you've got a... a a coalition of four males so it's just really great to see them again I've got a question from Debbie in Vancouver and uh, Debbie your question is what is my take on what was happening with the lines this morning do you know what, Debbie, I've got to be completely honest with you. I have no idea just because I wasn't watching. And uh, historically, uh, I'm not sure who... You've really got to know each individual, and uh, I'm not really sure what happened. Or, or Jamie did tell me a little bit about there was a bit of scuffling going on and, and so on, but I really can't uh, answer that honestly, Debbie, other than I think uh, now it's all settled down. I think it was potentially just one of the boys coming back and then a little discrepancy between the females and so on. I really can't uh, answer that with, with proper knowledge because also I didn't see it. But uh, the wonderful thing is that those cubs are all looking fantastic and the lioness are looking absolutely fantastic as well. They are really special, these animals. And being World Inter um, International Lion Day yesterday, it was really fitting uh, that we... We got lions and shown people how incredibly important these creatures are. As I always say, historically, just with, with this 
historically, economically, all these different things, but just on natural beauty as well. Sometimes we always have to put things in a in a place or in a pocket or in a pigeonhole why we need them. And I suppose scientifically that's fair enough. But you know what, there's this there's this sort of area of watching wildlife that you can't really put into a box and it's it's why we all do what we do. It's why you all watch. It's why we come and drive around relentlessly to find to visualize these beautiful creatures. I'm sorry, to get them visual. And it is just a beautiful thing to sit and be. It does good things for you watching wildlife. There's no doubt about it. Research has shown uh, with a lot of children uh, spending more time in the outdoors, they really do uh, improve their lifestyle in so many different ways. But without going into all the detail, it is a great thing for the soul and a great thing for young people growing up. But wow, how beautiful are these guys? Speaking of growing up, those little cubs, I'm just going to have a look through my binoculars. I'm not sure how many there are. Oh, if anyone can send me a, a tweet and tell me how many there are, that'd be fantastic. I can see one, two, three, four, and five. Am I right in saying that? Send me a tweet and help me out there. I can see five cubs, or is it six, five cubs? And the, the team have told me, but again, I... um numbers in your head and all different things going on and the school programs this morning and different things concentrating on different things uh, as you get older <laughs> you forget things yesterday or this, yesterday I had a shocker the, the, the final control the directors and were reading out questions to me with people's names and I was just I was just forgetting the person's name and the question by the end of the question. It's terrible. It's terrible. Oh, AJ. Uh, I still, uh, inside, I still feel like a little boy. But uh, sometimes you're just listening to different things. I'm driving around going, wow, I'm back in Africa. Oh, it's lovely. So these beautiful uh, creatures are going to be flat like this for some time. And I just wanted to get a, a visual on them so we could... Um, so we could come and just be here for ourselves, by ourselves for a little bit because there will be other vehicles arriving at some point when the, the uh, game drives go out from the different lodges. But he's a big boy now. So I think we're going to cross over to James and see what he's got and I think he's still with those beautiful creatures that we were with this morning. Gosh, can't get enough of them either. We'll be staying right here for a while and we'll see you just now. We are indeed still with the elephants everybody and we've had a wonderful time here. They've been sort of uh, standing next to us as a young bull here. His mother who's a little bit angry, I think it's his mother or maybe an aunt, has moved off now. She's just left. And they were sitting feeding quietly here at this mangled remains of a Combretum calinum or variable bush willow. And I said at the start there are probably about six to eight elephants around. I think they're probably closer to ten or fifteen. They're all sides of us and there's another lot coming now will, will come from the right. We're going to stay on this bull for now and then when these other chaps come a bit closer we'll go and show you them. See him picking off the last little bits of this hapless tree, which astoundingly will not die, despite the attentions of these elephants. It does amaze me the skill with which they are able to do that. They're able to not sort of stand or kick the really hard bits of the tree there. He places that foot exactly where he wants it and snaps exactly the piece of bush that he wants. and now fiddling with the last little pieces of leaf and stick that he thinks might taste quite nice for his tea or his lunch, I suppose. Not quite a tea time yet, are we, Brian? Mm, late lunch. Yes, late lunch. Wonderful stuff. There he is, just feeling there. Watch his trunk. I suppose you can't really see it behind the behind the legs but what's going on here is um, he's being very specific about which part of the plant he wants to eat and so he feels each one 
Did you hear that? That was him talking, everyone. He's talking to the female that's just moved off. Maybe she said to him, come on, let's carry on. I don't really like the cut of their jib. And he said, no, they're all right. I'm just enjoying this bush. I'm going to stay here a bit longer. Now, that sound they make, I'm sure most of you know, is made by the voice box. It's, although it sounds like a sort of low stomach rumble, it isn't. It's very much the voice box or the larynx that makes a noise, and it's because it's so very big, it's a massive larynx, that it's able to make that very, very deep, low-frequency sound. And you might be able to hear the sort of chewing. Mm. He's not being very polite about his eating, is he, Brian? No. No. Oh, he looks like Steph or Herbert looking for scorpions. So the extras with the trunk and the feet. Of course, you see him here delicately or his being so close, you might think to yourself, well, he could stand on his own nose. But what actually happens is that that trunk takes probably about two years before it's able to just flop onto the ground. And that's because it takes so long to learn to use. And those little elephants that you see with the tiny little trunks, they're unable to touch the ground. And that is because we think, or I think, I'm not sure I've ever read this, I think I might have, but I think it's because they're, it's to avoid them standing on their trunks and doing sort of permanent damage. Because they just sort of wave and flop about on the front of a young elephant's face. Until they're about two years old. Oh, very nice. Did you hear that, Brian? Mm -hmm. A nice little uh, blowout of flatulence there, everybody. If you are purely a vegetarian out here, especially if you're eating such a massive amount of roughage with not much in the way of nutrition, then you're going to make a lot of gas. And there is another little herd of three, probably part of the same herd. There we go. How? Now, you can tell the difference. She's a young, youngish cow, but she's clearly got probably at least one or two offspring. She's pushing him off. Isn't that amazing? They're only about eight meters from us, 24 or five, 26 or 7 feet. She's bigger than him, though, so she'll push him off. And you can tell very nicely there. That how, look how square her forehead is. You can tell immediately she's a female. Here's his not particularly round, this young bulls. But you can tell that she's a cow also from the fact that she is swollen um, on her chest. So elephants make the most sort of human humanoid feature. But they've got what we call inguinal mammy. No, sorry, pectoral mammy. So same as human beings, they've got their mammary glands on the chest, which is unusual for a mammal. Much more common that they're inguinal or down on the stomach. Same as dogs and cats and cows and goats and impala. She didn't like what he'd found. Beautiful. And still the only bird you can hear is that little single starling in the background going... Gosh, it is very soporific sitting here in the sun, I must say. Delicious temperature. I'm not quite sneezing, but certainly snorting up some of the dust that unquestionably goes into the trunk. I'm very glad I don't have to eat like that, where, you know, I want to push my nose into the dirt and inhale strongly. I imagine I might sneeze a bit. Brian, you definitely sneeze. Yeah, I'll be sneezing all day. Yes. <laughs> He's digging quite a hole here. If you look around, there are quite a few of them. 
Righty, we're going to sit here with these elephants a little bit longer. Let's, oh, sorry, my glasses were on. Let's go back across to Hayden and check out the lions. The sun is very bright. So, we just tried to get a better location, uh, but as we went round, we found that the bush was a little bit too thick around there, so we thought we'd stay where we are. Some of the females moved into the shade a little bit more. I was just saying to Jandre, sometimes I often, it amazes me, lions will pick the, the slimmest little sort of sliver of shade, and uh, there's another big patch of shade right behind them, but they just can't get up and move. It's like... It's like being so tired when the mosquitoes in your tent, you just can't uh, get rid of it. But they do, uh, they're just so, so flat out. It's like, oh, I'd just rather deal with the hot night, or the hot, sorry, the hot day. And uh, one of the females did move into better shade. And then there's a couple of cubs that are down there, and they've just followed her. So, look, we're just going to sit with them for a while and watch. There's a little interaction going down on there with the females. She's just laid back down now. But all the cubs are down there. And there is another male down a bit further. He's out of our vision at the moment. But he did sit up. So we know where they are. It's fantastic to be with them. And I think it's just nice to sit and watch. There's a little bit of interaction happening with the youngsters, which we're going to stick on for a little while. Uh, and we may get a female that comes up and greets um, this, this beautiful boy just here now. So let's see how we go. Um, and I'm just click, clicking away now and again, folks, because I just love pictures of lion, and I love these guys. I really love the Birmingham males, and uh, just a pleasure to be in their presence. Gives you a really good indication of that thickness of that mane while we're looking at it. That, that mane is... Uh, really 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 come along since uh, I've seen them last really darkened up as well so Tash Michelle has just asked us a question uh, about coalition males and is there a more dominant one? Look, um, coalition partners are usually sort of related males, not always, but usually related males that have left a pride in their adolescence. So there is some form of bond uh, through them and they stay together as nomads until they mature and they get the power. I mean, the great thing about being a coalition is that if you're a single male lion looking after a pride, you have stand very little chance of uh, uh, being successful in a fight or a dominancy uh, skirmish that up against a coalition of even two males. So there's, there's power in numbers, there's no doubt about that. He looks very comfortable there at the moment, doesn't he? Uh, and you know what? They, there's been lots and lots of studies done um, sometimes one of the boy, one of the males will be more dominant than others within them before they even meet females. And then you'll get uh, a male that will go off with a female and, and mate. Reproduction is uh, pretty much year round. And uh, it's synchronized within the prides and that's a result of ta these takeovers really. Uh, and you've probably heard of infanticide, Tash Fischel and everyone else listening, where the males that do win over a pride and oust uh, another male, they will uh, kill all the other offspring to make their gene the successful gene. So these takeovers sort of typically uh, three, sort of four cubs per litter occur, and they sort of synchronize it so that's why we've got I think the Jondra was telling me eight cubs but we're not sure uh, when exactly they were born well I'm not sure that's for sure many of you watching probably are so within that time uh, if one male goes off with another female and uh, does mate they <laughs> you've probably heard there's an estimated sort of mating of over 3,000 uh, copulations uh, 
copulation time so it's it's pretty incredible uh, it is really really difficult to say you'll find that another once one's out of the way one of the other males will just step in and try and mate if the other one comes in another one comes into estrus so there will be potentially a more a stronger more dominant male but uh, they avoid conflict in this coalition most of the time we saw some things this morning and as Jamie said this morning it's a lot of bark you know with lions but, you know if they know each other there's a lot of noise and and carry on but uh, they settle down as you can see so we're going to sit with these guys and I'm just going to take a few more photos and whilst I do that we're going to cross over to Brent who is on bushwalk and uh, that's fantastic to hear that he's out as well so great to be here and we'll see you just now Welcome to a walking safari in the middle of the African bush. My name's Brent, I have the incredible VM on camera today, and we're gonna take you on an adventure on foot. So the nice thing about bushwalk is we get to look at some of the smaller things that we don't often see from the vehicles. But if we're really lucky, and what I really love doing on foot, we might find some fresh lion or leopard tracks, and we'll be able to try and sneak up to them on foot. So very exciting to have you all here. Remember, we are live in the middle of the African bush, and you can ask me questions by using the email address questions at wildearth.tv or the hashtag safari live on Twitter. Let's keep going. So we've just set out across quarantine at the moment and we're making our way down towards Philemon's Dip. Now that's a little river system that runs through the center of Ajuma and it's a really good spot not only to look for lions and leopards but to look for lots of little critters as well as there's some evergreen trees around there, hopefully some insects. As you can see, it's incredibly dry around us. We're in the middle of the worst drought since 1992. Now, often people perceive drought to be a bad thing, but that is not the case. It is just a different cycle in nature. And it does some make it really great for certain animals, like the big cats and the hyenas. And it takes a little bit of a toll on the buffalo, the impala, the elephant but every animal has to have its time in the sun. So we've gone through an incredibly wet last 10 years. So all the herbivores uh, and a lot of the plant species have been really dominating and I can't believe I found the first wildflower after that tiny bit of rain. I didn't think I was gonna see a wildflower for months. It is a very sickly looking little heliotrope. There we go. Maybe I should let it go. It doesn't shake so much. Um, it is a little heliotrope or a string of stars it doesn't have, quite have a string on it. Now the reason it's called a heliotrope is because these little flowers will move through the day following the sun. And I really, the last thing I was expecting to find on Bushwalk today was a flower. You can see there's almost nothing. There's just sand at the moment. There ha we did get about 15 mils of rain a couple of weeks ago. And there's just a little bit, en enough moisture to have a little bit of flush and to have the first flower of the season. Hopefully we're going to see a few more once the rains kick in. I really do love wild flowers. Yeah, that was a shock to see a <laughs> flower at this time of the year. Now, James Dungan is wondering, why is an active termite mound darker than a, uh, than a non-active? And luckily enough for us, we've got one that looks quite active there. And you can see quite dark. And behind us, we've got one that is very inactive and actually has got a tree on top of it, a beautiful little thorny curry. Oh, no, sorry, a spike thorn, I beg your pardon. Now, the reason for that, James, is that the termites keep constantly working on uh, the, the, the different, the, the ones that are still active. But in some cases, that's not the case. So when you've got these large Macromides termites like that, um, they are building with different soil. When we've got these termites, which are probably a different species, you just look at the shape of the mound, they're bringing soil from deeper, so they're using different soil to build. So that's probably the reason. Sometimes it could be because an active one is constantly being uh, renovated when a deactive one is not. Okay, so as I said, we're going to keep heading down towards the little river system that runs through the center of Juma. A uh, great place to look for lots of things. So hopefully we're going to find something fascinating. And now I've, I've got my flower eye on since I saw one. Mm, not quite. 
but they, they look like they're about to attempt to flower. They're not looking too healthy though. Uh, this, this little plant actually doesn't even have an English name. Um, and it is a very interesting little plant because it is the host species for the Acrea butterflies. So the little caterpillars will feed off this plant, which is highly noxious, and in so ingest a poison that is hydrogen cyanide, which it then transfers through to the adults after pupating, making the adult noxious. Now, this is that plant I know I've asked and shown you on drive and bushwood many, many times. So this is the first quiz of the day. Who can tell me what the scientific name, because it doesn't even have an English name, is for the little plant here that is the poison host species for Acrea butterflies, my favorite butterflies. While we try to keep heading down towards the river system, let's go back to Hayden and some flat cats. Well, as is the case with uh, lions at this time of the day, we have flat cats still, but that's absolutely fine. We expected it to be. Um, we've just got another vehicle arriving, Mike from uh, Cheetah Plains, and he's just, oh, actually, I think it's Mike, or oh, someone from Juma. Oh, it's Mike Grover. All right, excellent, excellent, good, good, good. Just wanted to make sure we uh, were bringing people in to see this, ve this beautiful sighting uh, and sharing this with... Uh, people because that's what it's all about it's about sharing this beautiful experience on a really really quiet and relaxed level and you can see how calm these uh, these lines are beautiful females I love the shape of a line female lion's head I just think it's like it's so beautifully beautifully designed really really fantastic Got a question from Cindy from Tennessee, uh, and Cindy's question is: Is there any line injuries? Um, Cindy, can you just stand by for me? I just have to answer someone on the Game Drive channel, and I do apologise. Yeah, copy, mate. Uh, the little ones are here. Um, do apologise, Cindy. Uh, Cindy, your question was: uh, Are there any? injuries that we know of from the incident this morning. I don't know, Cindy, in the sense that I can't see anything at the moment. Everyone, there's no one licking wounds or anything like that uh, at the moment. But, you know, there could have been a little scratch here and there, but that does happen from time to time. Uh, at the moment, everything looks very, very peaceful and very relaxed. The cubs are just having a little, a little sort of a, a play down there. Very beautiful cubs, huh? Gosh. But I'm so impressed. Uh, I always think that those lines, the females, that head, particularly that sort of stand, they hold it up high. They sort of we don't know where these elephants are going. We don't know where they've come from. We just came round. The ears prick forward and they get that beautiful, beautiful shape. Just standing up, having a stretch. Here we go. And I'm sure we're going to just plonk back down somewhere. That muscularity as well. Goodness. What a beautiful creature. Little cubbies. Okay, so the four females there. So we were talking a little bit before about uh, the difference with the mane and you can see the females are maneless and the males have achieved that sort of become bulky, that, that's, that sort of um, that bulkiness, that large and showy beautiful mane has caused them to become so bulky and they, obviously it's a fantastic benefit to them when they're fighting or looking stronger and bigger towards other males but it's beca made them become very very conspicuous uh, hence the reason why you know people always used to say oh the females do all the work they do all the hunting the males are really lazy it's actually 
got a lot more to do with the, the, the males being very, very conspicuous when they hunt. They're still fantastic hunters, don't get me wrong. Uh, they will be in there, but the males do a lot of the really hard, big animal jobs, with like buffalo and uh, giraffe and things like that. If the females are potentially uh, struggling, if there's not enough on a really, really big animal, and there is a male around, it'll be that extra massive bulk that will um, pull the animal down. So we're looking at well over 200 kilograms. We just got a question from James Duncan, and James is uh, saying what would be the equivalent predator in Australia. Well, we really only had a, a, an animal there. It wasn't a tiger, but it was called a Tasmanian tiger or a thylacine. And they were at one time our biggest mammalian predator. Uh, and unfortunately, they are now extinct in Australia. But that would have been our biggest. We do have a dingo, an animal, uh, a dog, a native dog. Uh, and if one goes back in time, it, people think that they may have been brought across. Uh, who knows? I'm not really, really that au fait with the, the history of uh, the dingo to the point of knowing its evolutionary um, or its historical uh, status where it was in Australia and how many how many years ago it came. But the point is that it, it was an interesting situation where Australia broke away and was just, it's got these marsupials, this, this collection of marsupials that are so, so incredibly unique. A bit like Madagascar getting lemurs uh, and very, very interesting with the dingo is probably our biggest similar uh, large predator. But I'd have to re-answer that for you because you heard me say mammalian. Um, our biggest predator in Australia is our saltwater croc. The saltwater crocodile is absolutely extraordinary and it is the most massive predator. I, I've seen some crocs uh, that are just, you don't, do not believe that they're real. They are so massive and it is an incredible thing. We're looking at a, remember they are a living dinosaur crocodiles. So that's probably my answer for that. Uh, our, ne our next one down from that is a, we've got a Tasmanian devil, which is an incredibly wonderful animal as well. But uh, like a little mini hyena in its qualities of what it can do with its its strength of bite and its uh, incredible sound. They're more, more like a, the voraciousness of a honey badger. So thanks for your question, and a bit hard to compare really, but it is probably what I said, the dingo and the saltwater croc, and then we have that incredible creature called a Tasmanian devil, which if you need more information, you'll see some great pictures online for them, or you can go onto the Taronga Zoo website, we've got pictures of all of those. So what I'm going to do now is sit with them, we've got a little bit of activity happening with the youngsters down there uh, at the moment, and we're going to go across to Brent and see what he's got, something a little bit smaller, but just as beautiful. So we found my favorite bird, or of my, I've got lots of favorite birds, but this is my favorite of the Franklin species, and it's just scurried off, we're just going to hope it pops out again. I think, oh, there's another one, there's the female. So there we go, out in the open, and they're quite shy and retiring as Franklin go. There it is, it's the Shelley's Franklin. Now, they are far more often seen, I mean, sorry, heard than seen. And they have a wonderful <whistles> call that I got taught when I was very young by my grandfather. And it says, to drink a beer, to drink a beer, to drink a beer. So with a drought, we're seeing quite a few of these more retiring species more often. There's less cover. Normally they're, they're in the woodlands, they're in the, in the little river systems, and... Oh, as VM spotted there. Oh, there's a dwarf mongoose. As well. Hello, little mongy. Now, you probably find the Franklin and mongoose quite like feeding in the same area. You can see the Shelley's Franklin's about to appear next to the dwarf mongoose. And it's an extra set of eyes. 
and ears to spot potential predators. A lot of the the creatures that will feed off a dwarf mongoose will also feed off a Shelley's Franklin, such as African hawk eels, slender mongoose. There we go, there's the Shelley's coming out again. Oh, and the mongoose right next to him. Guys, so quite often when you're driving in a vehicle, the Shelleys will hear the car coming and then scuttle off. So it makes them a little bit more difficult to see. But we've just been going very slowly, very quietly, and we managed to get that wonderful bird on camera. We have got them on the vehicle before. I mean, then 20 feet from me and carrying on their business as normal. So we don't want to disturb them too much. So we're not going to move around too much. Let's see, there we go. So the Franklin will feed off quite a variety of different things. Grass seeds is a favorite, obviously not too many of those around. Any little bug or insect that they can scratch up. So you're not, probably not going to hear from this distance, but if you look very carefully, you'll notice the throat just dipping every now and then. So there's a little flock of them around, and just every now and then they just do a little contact call to check where the other members are. I've seen about three of them. There could be a few more. Andrine says she really loves the colouring of that Franklin. Me too, Andrine. I find them incredibly beautiful. Now, for our serious birders out there, there is a bird you might occasionally confuse with the Shelley's Franklin, and that is the, the female of the Koki Franklin, but it's about half the size, but they do have a white throat and very beautiful coloration, similar to that. But we're not going to disturb them, so I'm just going to sneak off this way. So let them carry on. We'll walk around to get to where we're going. They look so peaceful at the moment. That's a nice thing on bush walk. Elephants. Can you have some elephants? And we saw a buffalo over there as well, so that's why we changed our route. We just heard that low rumble. Now that's really important on foot to be listening for those type of signs. And I think we're going to leave those eddies. I think it's the same herd James was with a bit earlier. And we're going to continue on our endeavors. while you're on foot. It's because of the drought, a lot of those big animals like buffalo and elephant are going to be feeling pressure. So we're going to quietly move out of this area. While we do that, let's go see how Commander Bond's doing. Ding, 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 Oh, sorry, everybody, aren't we live? Um, that was just a little song called uh, Under Pressure by the late, great David Bowie and the late, great Freddie Mercury. This is utterly irrelevant to our safari, but for the link that Brent gave across to us. OK. We have left the elephants, everybody. We'd spent quite a lot of time with them. And now we are moving down a road called Ingwe Alley, which is uh, translated loosely, in fact, not loosely at all, Leopard Alley, and we're hoping to find a... Leopard. A leopard, exactly. With any luck, we will find Karula here, uh, two babies playing in the golden sun setting. Or nothing. At the moment, nothing. 
We're hopefully going to find some tracks of Karula. I don't know if anyone checked this morning. Uh, with the mayhem of the lions, I don't think anyone did. So, oh, there's a kudu, Brian. It's running to great speed. It too finds itself under pressure, reaching down on me. Okay, we probably have to stop doing that now. There'll be complaints. There we go. Beautiful young kudu with a whole lot of other kudus. Now, there are a number of words out here, everybody, that if you say them will make you feel good. Kudu is one of them. Zizifus being another. And Gymnosporia buxifolia, a personal favourite. It's one of the trees. Ultimate elegance these animals have. They really do. And very long tongues, of course. <laughs> she kind of ruined the effect there a bit, didn't she? <laughs> By licking her eye. <laughs> I imagine it'd be quite disconcerting seeing a, a model, male or female, and looking at looking upon them and saying, "Wow, that's a good-looking human being," and then seeing them lick their eyes. I imagine yeah, that would be yeah, probably fairly uh, unattractive. And we had a really, really good sighting the other day of some kudu on foot. And they just didn't react to us. And they're becoming more and more relaxed. And I don't know if that's got something to do with the drought and the fact that they, because they're under pressure, they're sort of reacting less and less to things that they're, you know, they're becoming slightly bolder. I think also the more silent you are around them, the less you move around the more they tend to realize you're not after them. We'll move a little bit forward. Oh no, she's coming out, is she? Lord, she's eating there. She used to be a bit of mud in there. I don't think there is now. The other thing you will definitely find, kudu and giraffe. We had an amazing sighting. Brian and I have a giraffe eating a bone yesterday. But kudu, absolutely, most of the browsers seem to be taking to a little of what we call osteophagia, the eating of bones, in order to help them with the nutri nutritional deficiencies of the dry season. Hmm. It's so quiet today. So few birds calling. Don't know why that is. You'd expect to hear one. There, we had a kingfish. Not a kingfisher. What are those big other fish-eating things called, Brian? Fish eagles. Fish eagles, that's right. That's not a very good impression, Brian. Can you do a kingfisher? Try. Here we go, everybody. Very nice. Kingfisher in the Distance by Brian Joubert. Let's move on. Oh, we didn't hear that, Brian. We're going to have to do it again. There's some nyalas around the corner here. So those are the kudu, the largest members of the Tragolaphid genus that we get here, the spiral horned antelopes. And here is the middle child, I think the world's most beautiful antelope or well, certainly the one most beautiful that we get here, some nyala, two young bulls, and they're sort of consorts, I guess. It looks like sort of a teenage gathering, doesn't it, Brian? Teenagers off to the movies, Brian. Certainly until they told their parents that's where they were going. They're probably going to a pub, though. Very naughty. Oh, and you can hear there the rather unattractive call of the lilac-breasted roller. And it's, it's that very foul call that has given rise to its Shungan name, Veve, because that's what it says. I can actually see it. I'm just going to see if I can spot it. 
Hey, so I can see it. A constant struggle to find enough food now at this time of year. And probably picking up dry leaves, you know, I think that's what they're eating. Anyway, they're behind the bushes. Let us continue on our merry way. And while we do that, Hayden has managed to cajole his vehicle into a position where you can now have a look at lion cubs. Well, we've got a little bit of action with our cubs down here playing around. We are we have to stay the distance we are, folks, because we would not dare to disturb them. They're having such a beautiful time, and, you know, we are happy to be here, and also we have our beautiful big male in front of us. So we, we are where we are, and it's just great to see them. They're becoming a little bit active as the la afternoon shadows lengthen, and uh, you could just get a bit of an indication as Jean-Dre pulled back there to show you where that boy is. And then the females are just down in the f in a little bit further on line, and moved into some better shade. And I do want to correct, uh, excuse me, sorry. I've got a question from Mr. Tuvak. Do, do lions have cold noses like domestic cats? Um, I haven't had the opportunity of feeling a lion's nose, Mr. Tuvak. Uh, but um, I am sure that uh, they have any, all of their, uh, their mucous membranes would be moist. Probably in really, really dry times, they'd be dried up. But uh, I haven't had the opportunity, nor do I think I'm going to test it out. I'm sorry to say if that's okay. Uh, but they definitely, definitely have a great sense of smell, that's for sure. Um, thank you very much for your question, and great to have you on board. I do apologise, folks. I made a bit of a, a blunder there, and I, I told you about how many times they mate. It was completely incorrect. I was just thinking about uh, something else. I don't know what came over me then, but it's uh, definitely not 3,000 times. It's about 2.2 times per hour over about four to five days. So I do correct myself there uh, when that mating session happens. I just was in Namibia and saw a female... Uh, and male mating most of one day that we were there and every time we come back uh, they were still you could pretty much time your clock to it it was quite incredible so I do stand I do apologize about that little uh, bit of misinformation and those little cubs are just so beautiful So they only weigh roughly about two kilograms when they're born for the people that are working in metric, which is, a, again, not one of my f most wonderful skills conversions of me uh, pounds to metric, but I'm thinking about four and a half pounds. It just depends on the... Not all cubs are the same size. And all the statistics and the things that you read are all... You know, there's always exceptions to the rule, particularly with when we talked about the coalitions before. I mean, every coalition and every dynamic, uh, line dynamic in different areas has, has uh, lots and lots of different uh, ex contributing factors that may change what books say and what research say. And things are constantly being discovered, and I think that's wonderful about science and wildlife observation is that you'll always see exceptions to the rule. Just walking around now. These little guys are becoming more active. I'm just sitting here waiting to see if um, one of them ventured up to this uh, big daddy here. If he's got the courage to do it yet or whether he's too young. But uh, I think Jamie said or someone said this morning they uh, they were playing with the adults this morning. So 
starting to become a little bit more active. Everything in any baby animal's world is experience and whether it be tussling with your brother or your sister and wrestling, honing your skills, getting stronger, practicing, uh, whether it's playing with a stick or wrestling with your brother or sister, and they're all learning skills for these little guys. They're pretty helpless when they're a kitten. Uh, they I'm not exactly sure how old these uh, these particular cubs are. Maybe one of you could tweet us uh, and let me know that and help me out uh, and tell me how old these particular cubs are because I know we've got really, really good data on most of our big cats on uh, Safari Live. So anyone that can send me a, a tweet, uh, that would be fantastic, or an email. Question from Pamela, um, do big cats ever eat grass or vegetation to aid digestion? Look, I'm not sure if it's uh, to aid digestion, but I've definitely seen big cats uh, eating grass, uh, definitely have uh, seen them do that, and it would pro one thinks that uh, that is why it's done. Most veterinarians uh, that I've talked to have told me that uh, that's the, the reason for it. Uh, and I tell you what, they, they really do do it. Not always, but I've seen them do it uh, when the grass is available. But I don't think they'd be... There's not a lot of grass around at the moment, that's for sure. But Pamela, I have seen it happen before, and I'm pretty sure most of the other uh, people on Safari Live would say the same. Uh, it's not common, but uh, they do do it. Thanks so much, Pamela, for being on board with us today. One of the things I always love is a sign when the adults are becoming uh, a bit more active. They start this yawning session, and once they start yawning, one yawns, they all yawn. It's like, <laughs> well, it's not like us at all because they're, they're probably not catching it, but they just, it's a sign or a signal that they are about to get active. And I'm not sure when the last time the females made a kill, but this boy looks in front of us at the moment. He looks, looks pretty well fed. He's not super fat but he doesn't look uh, doesn't look lean so who knows what's going to happen tonight we heard these guys last night these these males uh, vocalizing all over the reserve but particularly I, I went to bed at about probably 10 I think and one was passing our house and he let out just this just a little one and I thought he was going to go for it I was running for my phone just to record it for you but uh, that's all he did <laughs> and carried on beautiful so the little cubs are just starting to venture off going to explore and hassle their mom maybe go and have a bit of a drink see what happens So while these little guys are just becoming a little bit more active, uh, we might cross back over to Brent and see what he's up to. We're not going to go anywhere for the minute. Uh, we might just sit here. It's I know they're flat, but I'm just watching the, the cubs get a bit active, so they may come up and have an interaction. We'll just stay put, and we'll cross over to Brent. We'll see you just now. Fingers crossed this bird doesn't disappear. Have them. You see that silver cluster leaf? You see the moon there beyond? There we go. It's a black headed oriole. An exquisite bird that we hear often, but sometimes it's a little bit hard to find. I think just I've moved to the left here of that. Keep coming left to the left of that big tree and up a little bit. Just come out of it. A bit higher, and that's the 
There we go. I said boom right there, centre face. See that? Is that uh, <laughs> this is the one funny thing about little birds. Sometimes it's come up that he's a bit higher. There he is, there we go. Black headed oriole. Absolutely exquisite bird. You hear them calling regularly, but not too often do they sit for us. And quite often they're really high in trees, and this guy's quite low to the ground, doing a bit of preening. Okay, here we go. VM's going to try some ninja skills to get a bit closer. clean so it's very important for birds to have all their feathers in the correct position and for a couple of reasons it makes flying a lot easier and also when during that preening they remove lots of little parasites uh, but I think we'll try to move around see if we can get a better view from him on the other side so we've managed to reach the little river system that we've been trying to reach and you can see there's a bit more green around me so there's some underground water here so we're hoping for some little insects or something around one of these bushes. Okay, I think he's going. He's so far that Oriole isn't moving. Take one step. Okay, there we go. VM's going into ninja mode. Oh, he, and then he flies away. Oh, anyway, good try there. Uh, that's one of the things that happens. So let's head down into the little river system here. Hi, Mia. Now, Mia is one of our favorite viewers, and she's four years old. Mia would like to know what is my favorite thing about the bushwalk. Well, I think Mia it gives you a chance to, to really use your senses. To, to listen, to smell, and of course for me, it's always tracking. I love tracking, and we are looking for leopard tracks or lion tracks. This is always a good area to look. That's why I'm talking quite quietly, and hopefully we'll find some. But it's just looking at everything, man. It's being out here. Uh, you don't have the noise of the car, so you can hear so much more, and you're, you're focused on so many more different things. Okay. Now, this is always a favorite place of the, the buffalo bull, the dugger boy. We always approach these areas very carefully, and of course, we do have security detail with us, and that's Steph today. Now, as you can see, the reason I'm looking here, there's a, a, a very prominent game trail, and a lot of the cats like to walk down these game trails. So, just checking the tracks here carefully, Hoping to spot a leopard track. But alas, no luck so far. Uh, as you can see, we're going to dig down into the little river system and see what we can find in the bottom. Hopefully, it'll be lots of fun stuff. But while we do that, let's go see how James is doing. Ooh, look over that, everybody. It's a great thick tangle of bushes. In it is a common diker that has unfortunately disappeared. We had such a nice picture of him, and then he moved off, obviously. He's a bit camera shy. Let's go a little bit forward. We might be lucky, but also in the tree above us here, a great number. Was there a monkey, Brian, or was it just birds? 
There are lots of birds because, of course, this jackalberry tree is in full fruit now. So let's see if we can see the diker again. I suspect the diker has been here. Do you see any birds up there, Brian? No. Oh, yeah. I can see one. It isn't a bull boo. We just go up here, everyone. I want to see if we can't see that diker again because I suspect he's also been eating the fruit here. Let's not go over the top, shall we, Brian? No, he's disappeared into that thicket. Um, yeah, birding in thick trees is not easy because, of course, they are thick. Let me get out and see if we can't get a, a ripe fruit for you to eat because I've got to tell you, a ripe jackalberry is a delicious thing. Now, Jean-André always says I have to walk around the front of the car because that way you can see me go. Um, this, in this case, will result in severe injury to my person. Now, monkeys, baboons, birds, um, worms of various descriptions will try and eat these, which means that they're not always available to eat. And I can see a couple of skins here that have probably been dropped. I can see a couple of skins here. How's that, Brian? A couple of skins here, everybody. I'm not, I can't face away from you, at least towards you, otherwise the sound will cut. And I also think things like those diker will come through here and eat the fruits and then leave the skins here. At the moment I cannot find... Oh, here we go. Yeah, there you see the trees and I like the fruits here. <coughs> no sound. Unlike many of the fruits out here, they don't, um, <laughs> they don't ripen on the ground, they ripen on the tree. But there's one of the skins. Oh, wow. Brian, just above us there is a hoopoo. Beautiful sighting of a hoopoo. African hoopoo. Isn't that nice? It's making a very strange noise. They normally go boop, boop. Boop, boop. Boop, boop, boop. That one went. <laughs> anyway, there's a whole fruit, and you know they're ripe when they kind of lose this color. They lose this green color, and they go slightly brown. But there are no ripe ones here that I can see. Nor is there anything else here that I can see. So we'll continue. We've done a little turn past Treehouse Dam, where we didn't find anything, and now we're at Twin Dams, where there isn't more. But we're hoping to find some leopard tracks, like I said, as Brent is. <laughs> Squenzii, that's called, Brian. It's quite a vicious plant. Okay. On we go. Jackalberry tree diospirus mespiloformes. In the meantime, let's head back to Hayden and his lions. Well, we've just repositioned because these little guys got a little bit active, so I thought, why not let's get a little different spot, a different angle for Paul Jandre was in that spot for so long. Uh, I wanted to try and give him a couple of different angles and look what we've come down to find. There's a leg in the air. Yes, that's one of the Birmingham boys, but look just beyond that. Oh, he's put his foot in the way. <laughs> Do you believe it, Chandre? <laughs> he's gone and put his foot right in the way <laughs> of the cubs that we came to see. You big brute. <laughs> he just rolled over. It's a really common, uh, a common position for them to lie. We've got a question from Rivera, age nine, and uh, Rivera, you want to know what um, 
are the cubs afraid of their dad? Well, look, I think, you know, when they when they come into the into the group and the, the females start to bring them along with the probe, they're in hiding for seven, eight, eight weeks or something. These cubs, I'm pretty sure, Jandre was just, we were just talking about it beforehand, mate, uh, are about two months old, May and June. There was about five in May and then some in June. So they're only like three and two and three months. Uh, and now that they're traveling with the pride, um, they'd have a, a very, very deep respect for the males. And then as they get a little bit bolder and a little bit more courage, uh, Revere, they'll definitely start to go up and play uh, with Dad. But it's probably not a great time to approach Dad right now whilst he's asleep. Uh, they might get a little bit of a, a little bit of a push around. So it's really, really interesting. They'll pick the time, and they'll they can actually pick the body language when Dad uh, wants to have a bit of a, a play. I'm sorry, I just bumped my microphone there. But uh, they'll have a great respect for for the the big males, as they will for females. But uh, great question, mate, and so thankful you're watching. Uh, keep it up, buddy. If you want to follow this sort of stuff and you want to become uh, involved in wildlife at nine years of age, if you're starting now, absolutely sensational, mate. So great to have you on board, buddy. This is a question from Sarah in North Carolina, and Sarah, uh, would, uh, if a female from another pride came along, would she kill the cubs? <coughs> there would be no chance. There, I mean, these these three mothers. Uh, I think there's three females. Uh, they would fiercely, absolutely fiercely. It would be more likely the females would potentially uh, kill her. Uh, it, 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 every, the dynamics are so incredible. Uh, it, it just It's so hard to predict what would happen, but these cubs would be put into a spot where they would be protected uh, and the mothers would protect them with their lives. So I doubt it very, very highly. It would be only if there was a, a youngster that was so sick or emaciated that he was left behind uh, that that would ever occur. But uh, it's, it's something that I've never seen before, so I can't really say that it, it, it's very, very hard to predict the future, but it's a great question because the dynamic is that uh, incredible. We just, we see new things every day that we watch lions. But thank you so much for your question, and thanks for being on board with us this afternoon. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So they're going to be weaned off their mother's milk at between seven and ten months, uh, but they've got a long way to go yet. They're going to gain a lot of strength from uh, the mother after about sort of this time. They'll be she brings them. Sorry, we just got another vehicle uh, coming, and that's the noise that you can probably hear. So uh, it's just really, really great to watch them grow. And this little beautiful, beautiful cub right in front of us is somewhere between two and three months of age. So they'll stick with their mum until they're about anywhere up to about 15, 16 months. Uh, and that's a, an interesting thing as well, uh, and they'll be they'll be dependent on the pride uh, until that time. And again, it just depends completely on the dynamics. What happens if a, another coalition comes in, or so many different contributing factors? It's an incredibly complex uh, dynamic line prides, and constantly moving, constantly changing, and that's what's so fascinating about it.
that little cub is watching uh, the other other vehicle that's just pulled up. He's there completely relaxed. We were just up near that other male, and we uh, started the vehicle, and he didn't even didn't even move. He just laid there, and we just turned around and drove around the other side. So these animals are very very used to us. They're very comfortable. When we drove up to this location here uh, with this boy that's in shot, he just rolled over and laid in that position. So that's the wonderful thing about where we are right here in South Africa. These animals feel safe. They don't find us a threat. We understand how close we can go. We would never overstep the mark. And we watch from a respectful distance. And that's what we're doing right now, enjoying this beautiful time with these, these boys and girls and cubs. So another really th interesting thing about the cubs is um, the survival is highest when reproduction is synchronized because they will have communal suckling and uh, that does have huge benefits, absolutely massive benefits because if that's the case uh, you'll find if there's a synchronized litters or synchronized uh, birth rate and those cubs are all the same age, you're not going to have older cubs hogging all the milk, particularly with that, uh, that communal suckling. So it is a benefit, and they've got the highest, the highest sort of survival rate uh, when, that, when that comes. Right, so what we're going to do now is stick around for a little bit longer, and I will probably leave this sighting and give someone else an opportunity to come in here soon. So we're going to go over to Brentwith Bushwalk, and we'll make a decision on what to do. We'll see you just now. So we've spotted the tallest animal in Africa, but he's also spotted us. Now that helps when you're tall, you're able to see things from far away. So I'm just going to show you where he is. He looks like a big male giraffe. Well, we are going to try to get closer to him, but since he spotted us from here, we're going to walk away from him and then disappear into a little river system and try to use it. Um, let's have a look. To the left a little, I think. Look at the shape of that tree. Go to the left a bit more. I think it is. There we go. So it's not the best view of a giraffe from here, and you can see him. And he's munching away there. But we're going to try find a, a route where we can get a better view of that big male giraffe. Now, giraffe are quite an interesting and fun animal to walk on foot, so sometimes if you sit down and they see you from far away, they actually walk up to come have a closer look at you, sort of peer down at you. Uh, but he's busy feeding. And we don't want to chase him or disturb him, so we're going to try to find a nice way to get a bit closer to him. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the slightly thicker area on the edge of this little river system uh, to mask our approach. Although I think he's probably going to spot us being that tall, but I'm just hoping we can get to a spot where we're far enough away that he feels comfortable uh, and we can have a good view of it. He's watching us quite carefully, but we're still quite far away. So, let's just get to the edge of the river system. He started eating again. Oh, you okay there, Vian? There we go. So you can see, one of those evolutionary advantages of having a long neck is to spot potential predators at a distance. So he's had a look at us and decided, well, we're not actually a threat. He's going to carry on eating. Now, 
Now, the main evolutionary advantage of having such a long neck is not competition for food or spotting potential predators. It's competition for females. Uh, that males with the longest neck are able to swing the hardest and inflict the most damage on their competitors and hopefully chase them off so they maintain mating rights. But we're going to keep moving along the edge of this little river system. And while we do that, I'm really hoping to find some fresh sign of leopard. Let's go see how James is doing. We were also hoping for fresh signs of leopards, of course, everybody, but we then passed somebody from Chitwa Plains. No, Chitwa Plains isn't, doesn't exist. From Chitwa Chitwa, and they said that Karula has been found safe and sound with her two babies on Little Gari. So unfortunately, they are south of the reserve and we will not be able to go and see them. She will come back, don't worry, and she doesn't have a kill, which isn't so good for her, but it's good for us. That means she might come and look for one here. Right, we're heading towards Biffleshook Dam now, where I'm hoping there'll be some form of activity. But we will t tell shortly. And I'm just constantly amazed. It's kind of slightly strange vegetation at the moment, because if you look into the middle of it, well, it looks like there's not very much going on, but there is at the same time this little flush of green from the bit of rain that we've had and that's on the ground, not in the trees. Righty, let's see. Tracks of lions, old tracks of lions going towards Torchwood. So we can't follow them. What is that? Is that a Nyala? Brian? There, can you see it? He's through there, it is a Nyala. So just a brief shot of a Nyala bull, everyone. I don't think we're going to worry about it. It's so thick in there. Just about at the dam. I always arrive at this dam expecting really great things. Don't you, Brian? Every time. Every time. Let us hope that our, our great expectations are not met with disappointment. <laughs> Hello Katya, what a very good question. You say, how do we remember the names of the Latin or the Latin names of all the plants here? Um, Katya, it's for me, I think it's different for everybody. I mean, some people just you hear them, you know, there's extremely irritating people who hear something once and then they know it. For me, it's just repeating them again and again and again and again. And I remember that the last one I learned was Terrazygum zambesiacum. No, Terrazygum obliquum. Yeah, that's the Terrazygum obliquum. And that is the sneeze wood. And the sneeze wood tree, uh, it, it took me an afternoon. I kept saying it again and again on the walk. By the end of it, Scott and Steph wanted to kill me, but I knew Terrazygum obliquum as the sneeze wood. And there's a fantastic sighting, everybody here. Uh, that is Michael Grover and his family, uh, the Grovers, and their small child on the ground. There are very clearly no predators in this immediate vicinity, otherwise these people would not be risking themselves. Or their child. Okay, on we go. Enjoy. You haven't seen anything here, have you? Ah, oh, no. no. They haven't seen anything here. I think that's just a stick. It is. Huh? I thought it might be a male lion, but it isn't. Alrighty, on we go. We're going to head down into the valley of the Umluamati. See, we still don't really know where that other lioness with her tiny little cubs is. So it's quite a nice idea to go through here and see what we can find there. Right, the cubs are back up and playing. Let's go and have a look at them.
Well, we're still here with these little guys, and Paul Jandre's just waited so patiently with me here for the little one of the cubs to move into a good spot for you to show, uh, for us to show you. Sorry, and he just stopped about two centimeters. I cannot move any closer where I, from where I am, so we're just going to have to be patient for him to just to sit forward a little, a little uh, closer. Tula Ann, fantastic to have you here again. This is so great. Four years old. You are four years old and watching this. I am so happy about that. You've got a great question, and your questions are great, 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 because I tell you what, there's probably a lot of other people that thought about this as well. Are the babies hungry? Well, you know what, Tula Ann? You can't see it from here, unfortunately, because we've got a lot of, of sticks and leaves in the way over there, my friend. But uh, the, there's females over there, mamas, and she's got babies over there, and they're suckling, they're drinking milk from their mama. And isn't that fantastic? So any time that they want something to eat, they just go across and drink their mama's milk, which is fantastic. So I don't think they're hungry. They've got full bellies. They're playing. They're having a great time. And uh, we've also got a couple of other ones sleeping as well. But what a beautiful question, Tula, and I'm so happy that you're watching and great to have you on board the back of our safari vehicle with us today. Keep watching, my buddy. We're going to cross over to Brent because Brent has got one of my, my favourite, favourite animals right in his sight. So let's go and see what he's got there. So even with all our sneaking about, Mr Giraffe has kept his eye on us. And without disturbing him, I feel this is about the closest we can get. He tends to watch us every now and then, but not too perturbed, carrying on feeding. And of course, uh, current dry conditions, very important to keep feeding, keep ruminating, keep well fed. Uh, we're not going to try sneak any closer. As I said, a lot of the herbivores are under massive pressure with the drought. So the little we can, the little we can inconvenience, inconvenience them. Oh, getting stuck on my words there today is the better. But I am still, oh, well, just because we've just had a giraffe, we have some giraffe dung right here. Now, the reason I know it's giraffe dung, even though there are other animals that sometimes have very similar sized droppings, is the way it is lying. So it has fallen from great height and scattered, doom, like that. And that's one of the ways you can tell it's giraffe dung. And quite old. This one's rock hard almost already. There we go. So there's giraffe dung. So always in a wide scattering pattern, not a tight ball like you would expect to find from other antelope. Okay. So walking around little river systems like this is, is, is oh, one of my happy places. And you can always see there's quite a lot of hyena tracks that have moved through here. And it always amazes me of how many places I you know walk. Now we're going to go down, down deep into the drainage. Always a good place to look for signs of leopards. And ah, oh, we've got some very interesting tracks. We're going to get ask for them to come down, so it's going to be a bit easier for him, because uh, otherwise it's going to be a bit difficult. Now, the Inkahumas killed a buffalo a while ago, just after that 15 mils of rain. And this is their tracks from when they were in the area. Now, it's almost solidified in here now. I mean, it's rock hard. Yeah, rock hard track. So, from when that rain was, you can see how uh, going uphill, they've had to really dig in and grip onto the mud to get up the hill. There's actually quite a few different sets of tracks of them around here. You can see slipping and sliding. 
That's a lion track as it slipped down the hill. Really, really interesting. There's always lots to look at. Now, uh, I have heard that, unfortunately, the leopard whose tracks I was hoping to find in this area, Queen Karula, has been found to the south of us. But you never know. We could get Tingana or Mvula or Shaluva. There's always a possibility of it. some elephants in the distance. Always a possibility of finding something out here. Now, we're going to walk in the riverbed here, because this is a riverbed we don't often get to explore nicely, due to the fact that it's near impossible to get even our little safari vehicles into here. And it sounds like that flower quiz right in the beginning has stumped everyone, so I'm going to have to give away the answer. The answer to the host poison plant for the Acrea butterfly is Walfaria indica. Okay, so we're going to keep meandering through here. We are going to start making our way back towards camp, but if we do find anything interesting, uh, we will definitely show it to you. But let's go see how HT is doing. Well, we're doing just fine here. Uh, we haven't had a lot of action, but we do have a lot of cuteness in in the frame right now. And this little cub is uh, been yawning and looking up, looking incredibly intently at us, but not in a concerning way whatsoever. Just fascinated. But it, it, it is such a young age when they get conditioned to and habituated to us. It's fantastic for us because the little cubs won't get uh, scared either. They'll learn that we all the vehicles are not to be feared. And it does give us the opportunity to have these incredible sightings and these incredible encounters at close quarters with these magnificent creatures. So that's what it's all about. It's all about uh, gently, gently just conditioning and habituating the animals to uh, the vehicles so we can show you these beautiful pictures and have you on safari with us. Look at that. Stretching. They're very, very cool. A little bit of cleaning. They're truly social, these cats. Lions are just the social cat. They're, the dynamics, as we've talked mostly about tonight, is incredible. Ah, oh, today, sorry. And constantly changing, constantly uh, showing human beings that there's differentiation to every single... You know, there'll be common traits that occur, but there's always going to be ex exceptions to rules through lots of different factors but it's just great to be and it's great to learn about them every day i think that one of the great things uh, about safari live is a long historical documentation of this as well which is just beautiful I've got a, uh, a question from Joanne. Fantastic to have you with us, Joanne. We just watched this little guy walk off. It's just... It's just so beautiful. Joanne, I'm coming to your question. We're just going to see what he's up to. I'm just taking a couple of little cheeky snaps here whilst I've had a bush right in front of me <laughs> uh, all that time. He's just walking through to play with his brothers and sisters. A little bit of wrestling. Hugely important for young cubs growing up. Learning all the skills and, as we talked about before, strengthening themselves. We might have another one walking through right now. Joanne, I'm definitely coming to your question. I'm just trying to keep a visual on these cubs. No, he just plonked down. There we go. 
So, Joanne, your question was, do we have these sorts of uh, drives and uh, activities in Australia similar to this, national parks and drives like this? We absolutely do. Uh, we have beautiful, magnificent national parks throughout Australia, and we have lots and lots of drives and tourism there. Uh, we don't have big carnival predators like this. So it's a lot of places do do a lot of walks, but you do cover vast distances. So drives through beautiful uh, national parks are very, very common, as are walks. Uh, you do have to be very careful. We do, <laughs> we might not have carnivores this big in Australia, but I tell you what, we do have uh, everything else that's small, reptilian, uh, arachnid, octopus, or crocodilian. Um, there, they've got a very, very sharp end. A lot of them. We've got some very, very toxic uh, uh, snakes. Uh, we've got some venomous snakes. Sorry, we've got some very venomous. Uh, we've got a ven venomous octopus. A lot of spiders that are uh, venomous, and of course the magnificent saltwater crocodile. Um, so look, we've got an incredible array of things out there you have to be very careful of. But at the same time, you would do exactly the same as you do in Africa. You go out with someone that you trust, someone that has respect for the, the environment and the habitats, and to show you that wildlife without encroaching on that wildlife and changing its behaviour. And, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful place. So if ever you get a chance to get that, go there. I highly recommend it. And uh, it'd be great to hear if you do. Thanks so much for your question, Joe, and great to have you on board. So we do feel like we're pe peering through the undergrowth at these beautiful creatures. But whilst we're staying here, uh, we're... I really want to just sit around until they get... We've been here for long enough that I do think we deserve to see them uh, start to yawn and stretch and greet because it's just a beautiful, beautiful process. So we're going to cross to James, and he has something rather beautiful as well. We'll see you just now. It is an elephant's bottom that uh, Hayden was referring to, everybody. We do have something rather beautiful. It did turn to face us, young elephant bull. I'm sure the rest of the herd is in this bush somewhere around here. But there you can see him feeding away, as is the thing that he has to do all the time. Ooh, brilliant. Breaking sticks. Very good to see. Isn't that lovely? That foot is amazing. I'm just going to move a little bit forward so you can get a better view of it. Is that okay, Brian? Brock, very nice question from you about whether or not elephants dig for salt. Brock, they don't dig for salt, no, but they will eat uh, soil, salty soil, and they'll find that in what we call sodic areas. So I don't know how long you've been watching, Brock, or if you've come to Cheetah Plains with us before, but at Cheetah Plains you find what we call sodic areas, and it's an area of very high sodium, and they will certainly use those areas to engage in what we call geophagia, which is the eating of soil. But no, there aren't any kind of known salt deposits. Uh, digging for salt? I don't think so, Brock. I don't think that they would dig necessarily for subterranean salt, no. Just listen, this, I can't believe how quiet this afternoon has been. There's been very little bird song at all. Just the breathing and the blowing of the dust by his trunk, and then that amazing sound of him scraping there. Hello, big fella. 
He's just sticking his ears out at us, coming to say hello. Well, I don't know that he wants to say hello, Brian. What do you think he's trying to say to us? Hmm. Hello? Hello. Hello, Hello, Illy. (laughs) (laughs) Brian greeting the elephant, everybody. It's a friendly fellow, our Brian. Hmm. If you don't speak to the animals, they'll never speak to you. Well, that is true, Brian, yes, I suppose. I think, maybe. is rather splendid. Oh, really? Why he wants to do that, that's not very nice of him. I think he's just, all that was everybody is a demonstration to show how big and strong he is. And now he's wandering off. So he thought, I think he probably thought about actually pushing it over completely and then decided, no, he didn't think that was a good idea. Possibly because he thought it was a bit strong. He might um, sort of destroy himself. Okay, we're going to go back across to the lion cubs because they're now grooming like all good young children should. So we haven't really had much change here except the cubs have moved away from the position they were in and that's fine. Uh, They've just gone over to have a little drink. I'm just trying to get a better location for uh, for Jandre to get a shot but just through there you can just make out, can you? I think if you go to the left a little bit Jandre, just there's a cub there but if you go along to the left you might get one of the females lying their face down, it's so tricky through there. Uh, there's just a little cub there. You can see the female's paws, and just to the left, you can see just at the left of frame there, the female's face. Very tricky to see, folks. We are right behind uh, some vegetation, and it's the best we can do at the moment. And I would not push it any further because I don't want to disturb them. They're absolutely fine with us being here but I hope to get better visuals for you with Jandre uh, as they become more active this afternoon. So you can see she's just rolled over. Legs up in the air, and I think the... (laughs) So... We're still here, we've still got them visual, uh, but I think uh, Mr. Leo Smith has got something incredible as well, and it might be rather big. Let's go and see what Brent's up to. So, it's not often we get to approach a breeding herd on foot in perfect conditions. And we've got a nice steep bank, the elephants on the other side. So, they caused us to come out of the drainage line because we could hear them. And the wind is coming into my face, so they're not going to smell us. So we can just have a quick look at them. You can see that one. Looks like a young bull closest to us. Probably, I'm not sure how many. I've seen about four or five different individuals. When we're walking up to breeding herds of elephants, this is what you want. Uh, you want wind into your face. You want a nice steep drainage line. They're on the other side. They're completely unaware of our presence. Now, a lot of people think Elephants have bad eyesight, or they don't. They have pretty good eyesight, but they definitely rely on their hearing and their smell far more. But we're going to move. Oh. Big rumbles there. 
we're going to move out of this area because they are feeding towards here and we don't want to disturb them. So we're going to keep walking. And we, we were planning to go through here, but we're going to have to go a bit further out. still quite far there. Hi Debbie. Debbie's in Vancouver and Debbie's wondering about the clouds in the sky. She says, are those cirrus clouds up ahead? Uh, if I remember my cloud studying correctly, Debbie, I think these are even ultra cirrus. So those are just little icicles up there. And Debbie said, are we expecting a weather change because of those clouds? I don't think so, Debbie. It's just been quite chilly for the last couple of days. I mean, those are thousands of feet up in the air. But I, I don't think we can be expecting a, a weather change from them. No, sorry, not ultra cirrus. Stratus. Oh, I'm going to have to go brush up on my clouds, Debbie, to see what is the highest. I'm trying to remember it's stratus. I think they're stratus, Debbie, not cirrus, sorry. Stratus right at the edge of the stratosphere. Okay, I'm just going to double check carefully through here. Now we're going down where the road crosses the drainage line. The elephants were still quite far away. But with these things, it's always better to err slightly on the side of caution. I said a lot of the animals during the drought, especially your big herbivores, are under a lot of pressure. So we don't want to add any extra pressure. They could be a little bit more temperamental, uh, especially on foot. Here we go, you can see that's the little drainage system that they are feeding through. And we're just gonna go around, make sure we don't disturb them. So we're going to leave these elephants now and try to find a nice safe passage through back towards the area we want to go. And while we do that, let's go back to HT and those glorious little Inkuma cubs. Delectable is a fantastic word. They're so funny and they're so wonderful to watch. They're all becoming quite active and wrestling with each other. I love how these these beautiful creatures, they'll find anything in their environment to play with. It'll be just a, a stick or a, or an, a, I don't know, an elephant dropping anything. I saw one of uh, Karula's cubs the other day uh, push an elephant uh, bolus over the edge of a little hill and then it rolled down and I think it was Hosanna and he chased it down and then tackled it, you know, and it's great to see the play because it ends up becoming a very, very important developmental stage of their life where they learn how to hone their skills in hunting and survival and uh, little one stalking up to his brother or sister there. They don't chew anything, they... Just exploring their world is what it's all about. Now the four is f one, two, three, four, five, I can see at the moment. There's one coming, oh, it's just sat right there. It's just this little bit of vegetation in between us. Um, so we're hoping that they'll come over this way and uh, see how they go. Really beautiful. The sun's, the light's becoming magnificent too for these uh, these images that we're bringing to you. They just backlit a little bit at the moment, but the females are still flat out. The males are still flat out. It's only the cubs that are awake. At one little one right through there, Jandre playing with mum at the moment, standing on mum's head. It's very difficult to see. 
but oh, it's so so tricky, so tricky for for Jandre. I uh, I do apologise for not having you in a better position, but it's impossible to get any closer, and we don't want to go any closer and disturb this this lovely afternoon that they're having on the side of a termite mound. Mum has just woken up because um, her cub is chewing on her ear, which I suppose would wake you up. Just waiting to see if these uh, youngsters move over this way towards the male. If you've got any questions or comments, that'd be great. Monty's got a question about how long will it be before the males uh, move off or get pushed away to from the pride. Well. They'll be tolerated up to a point, uh, and they'll probably get pushed away when they're adolescents. Uh, they'll move away and uh, have to, they'll be ousted from. As soon as they start to show any interest in a female, uh, they will definitely be pushed away. It, it really does depend on the situation, uh, and particularly with the coalition and these males. Uh, depends on what changes in that dynamic as well, but so many different dynamics uh, happen, as I said. So when they go through the adolescence stages of or you know, years, they'll start to get uh, they'll get one slap from the male, and they'll get they'll basically get told there might be a bit of a scuffle, and they would rather not have that uh, that interaction and, and risk injury, and then they'll get the word from the males to move. Uh, out of the out of the pride, they normally. So let's talk about adolescence. What does that mean? I suppose two two and a half years, they'll be pushed out of the pride. The males. So great question, Monty. And uh, we've got a ways to go before that happens with these little ones that are about between three and two months and three months old. So. It will be a matter of uh, survival, really. That's the most important thing for these little cubs now. But I tell you what, they've got a, a force behind them, these two Birmingham males, and one, two, three. We've got three, no, four adult females here. Jandre, can you see? Four. So it will never be the males that have grown up in the pride that will take over that pride. It will be because they'll be pushed out way before uh, they get the opportunity to get strong enough to ta challenge the the uh, resident males. So those resident males are normally immigrants or nearly always immigrants. They've come in and they've taken over a pride. Hence what the uh, the Birmingham boys are, a force to be reckoned with. So it's about five to five here in South Africa. The sun is definitely heading down over the horizon. Slowly, slowly. It's got about half an hour, a little bit longer to go. And we'll start to get uh, the pride waking up in the next 20 to 30 minutes. But there isn't a lot of ha action happening at the moment, folks, I have to say. A lot of sleeping going on. So if you've got any more questions or comments, it would be great to, to hear from you. Uh, anything that you can teach me about these... Uh, 
and Kahumas and the Birminghams. Uh, I'd love to know any sort of interesting facts. If you can tweet us at hashtag Safari Live or you can email us at wildearth.tv, um, questions at wildearth.tv, sorry. Um, it's always great to pick up little bits of information from uh, Safari Live followers that uh, watch a lot of this religiously, much more than I get a chance to do. And uh, it's always great to pick up little bits of knowledge from, from you all out there. Not sure if you can hear that little noise. But there's two, <laughs> two, bro two offspring suckling from their mum, pushing each other. They've both got access to milk, but one's pushing the other one one way and the other one's pushing the other way. It's like, that's my side, that's my side. Very tricky to hear. So, I think we're going to stay put. We're just in a really nice position here, folks, if that's okay. Uh, I do want to see them wake up and start to interact and that beautiful social activity that occurs. It would be really great if we get a chance to do that before the sun goes down. Uh, so we are going to cross over to James and see what he's up to. We'll be back with you just now. I think much better than seeing me, everybody, let's look at this amazing elephant, young bull. We've been enjoying him for some time now. He's just great fun. He's got a couple of other sort of colleagues around the place, but he's pretty much on his own here. And I think he's, I mean, I hate to say that, well, I don't hate to say it, but I'm not sure if I'm correct in saying that I think he's quite enjoying just having a bit of company, to be honest. That's what it looks like. He could have moved off, but he's kind of been feeding on the trees just around us. Mm, there's a drongo there flying in and around his feet. As I say that, he moves off, of course. See if we can move along next to him. I cannot believe how quiet this afternoon is. There's no, no sound. No birdies calling. There are a couple of grey go-away birds now. Brent is still out on bushwalk, so let's quickly go across to him and let him say goodbye to you, I think, for this time round. So, one of the most dangerous things on quarantine, especially when we were doing our Bush Olympics, is the large devil fawn. Now this was our Olympic stadium today. And uh, when one runs barefoot through here, one has to be very careful of such creatures as this. Now that is the seed of a large devil thorn. It's incredibly, incredibly designed. Now if you ever see an impala or a kudu limping, what happens is that, well it's very difficult to do, but there we go, there's that, the two things. As they walk, it's designed to stick in between their hooves like this. And see how it creates a sort of flat surface, but you can't, whoopsie, you can see how uncomfortable they are when it is in there. And that's how they disperse their seeds. So this is dispersed by buffalo, kudu, impala, and nyala if they happen to stand on these seeds. My personal favorite for them is to put them on people's chairs when they're not looking. Same principle as a drawing pen. So we've been surrounded by elephants in all areas. 
Uh, we're trying to make our way back towards camp, but while we're out on quarantine, I'm feeling good, feeling a bit safe. So let's go out. out. Let's see what we can see. And I'm just trying to make sure. Oof, there's lots of them here. Ah. Now, he's got quite a cool little hole here with sets of tracks. Now, normally, one would find quite a lot of grass seeds and stuff outside a hole like this, but there's very few. There's one little, little fluff ball of a seed there. There's very few seeds. Normally, there'd be a pile of seeds outside the front here. And I can see the little tracks. Now, this is the home of a bushveld gerbil. So, uh, a little... Not so much as a rat or a mouse, but somewhere in between. And they're doing some housekeeping. Normally when they do housekeeping, you'll find lots and lots of little grass seeds, but obviously there are not that many grass seeds left for them to eat at the moment. And then I have a question there, just missed it, sorry. But about what was my most memorable bushwalk? And that was from Zoe. Oh, Zoe, I've had such fantastic times in the bush. Um, we'll do a before safari live bushwalk. I think one of my most fond bushwalks uh, was in northern Botswana with my dad. And uh, there's an incredible area up on the Kwando River there. You've got these massive African ebonies that have fallen down. So basically, we climbed up into one of them. And it sort of fell out of the bank, but it hadn't quite fallen all the way over. And about 3,000 buffalo came and drank. We had buffalo drinking underneath us, and we just had to sit there and wait till they finished. They had no idea we were less than five feet above their heads. That was a very special bushwalk. Um, a Safari Live special bushwalk. Hmm, let's think. Um had some really wonderful ones with some big Ellie bulls not too far from here actually and that has been incredible always love spending time with Ellie bulls on foot and then actually another very memorable bushwalk was with my little brother and uh, it happened not that long ago he is now a safari guide as well but he wasn't sure what he wanted to do at that time and I took him tracking lions at home and uh, we got charged by a big male lion and he stopped at about seven or eight feet from us and uh, that was very that was very memorable and and all, more so because it was the first male lion charge my or lion charge my brother had ever ever faced and I like to think it was one of the things that put him on the leaving the world of accounting and coming into the bush to be a safari guide okay you can see and all the elephants are behind us but we can hear some more elephants over there so I think we're actually going to try and make it up through the middle of quarantine before we get engulfed in elephants. So we're probably not going to see you again on the sunset safari, but have a great time with Hayden and James. And speaking of James, let's go see what he's up to. James, everybody, is trying desperately to get some sort of an artist, artistic photograph of the elephant and the sun and failing. Brian, how, how are you doing, Brian? Yeah. Not sure I'm winning on that score. Anyway, it's very difficult. I'll tell you why, everyone, if you're vaguely interested in photographs. It's difficult because the your eye is uh, very much more clever than any lens that's ever been designed. Your eye is able to expose for two different lightings. So if you look at the sky there, it's much lighter. If you look at the ground, it's much darker. Now, if you're looking at that with your naked eye, it, your brain is so clever that it immediately adjusts so that nothing is silhouetted. You can see it perfectly, unless you're looking directly into the light. No camera lens is able to do that yet. See how it changes as you come onto the darker stuff. Anyway, Gracie, I think you have made a very, very clever comment, as always. You say you love how all the little baby animals out here find their own toys to play with. They don't have to go to the store. 
you're absolutely right they don't and they do play you've seen them playing with sticks they play with elephant dung sometimes they play with all sorts of things that they can find and it's a very very astute or clever comment let's go a little bit around here I'm so enjoying spending a bit of time with these young bulls hello Tasha Michelle you're wondering about sunscreen. That's an interesting discussion that I, I had with Rebecca yesterday. Well, actually, Rebecca just told me. She said, sunscreen ain't so good for you, and you want to know if these elephants need sunscreen in the winter, and I was just saying that I didn't need it in the winter at all. I, we spend a bit of time outside during the middle of the day, and you just don't burn because of the angle of the sun. So your question is about whether or not these elephants will cover themselves in mud. Uh, during the course of the winter. They do a little bit. We had a nice sighting on a quite warm day of elephants covered in mud. But they don't have to. And I think one of the reasons that they don't, apart from the fact that they don't burn, I mean, they wouldn't burn anywhere, really. But the, one of the reasons is there's not much mud around, you know. There's very little other than in one or two of the pumped pans. But even, I mean, they could go to Buffersook Dam, they could go to Treehouse Dam and Twin Dams and find some mud and throw it in themselves, but no. I don't seem to be doing much of that. It's an interesting one. I think possibly because a, it's not so warm, and B, yeah, maybe that angle of the sun, which means that your skin doesn't burn in these conditions, means that they don't need to. Ah, now Gail. I'm just going to sneak forward while we answer this question, not because it's relevant. Oh, no, you've got a very artistic shot. Let's stay here, Brian. Um, <laughs> you want to know how much water, Gail, animals are able to derive from their food. And, Gail, the answer very much depends on the animal you're asking about. So a kudu, for example, is almost entirely water independent, same as a steenbok. They can get, they've got specialized kidneys and they can derive as much water as they need from the foliage that they eat. Now that brings with it, of course, risks. The risks are that you have to have a special kind of digestive system and therefore um, it's quite expensive to maintain and you've got to be quite selective over what you eat. Then animals like elephants get almost no moisture from their food. They get rid of a lot of moisture in the dung and in the urine and they must drink normally once, sometimes twice a day, buffalo the same sort of story. So it really does depend on the animal before you can know exactly how much they're able to use their food for water. Let's just sneak forward. Another nice elephant there. Tasha Michelle, <laughs> you have asked a million dollar question. When do we expect rain? Well, Tasha, um, their predictions are, and certainly the landowner has taken them very seriously, that there will be a flood year, probably beginning around late October, early November. Now, I take all of these predictions, as does everybody serious, with a bit of pinch of salt. And I'm sure Yuri, who's the landowner, does as well. So there is an expectation that this is going to be a very wet year. We would expect the rain to come probably in late October. We might get the odd downpour in sort of September time. That's quite possible. But it probably won't be too much until then. Listen how quiet it is. A lot of birds singing. Light is just starting to sort of soften now. It's taken a long time. It was really bright when we went out earlier. Beautiful. This, is, this one's even younger than the other one. Hello, Anna. A nice question from you about whether or not elephants see in colour. Anna, I don't think they do. I think they see probably in... They probably don't have great colour vision in the same way 
that most of the herbivores out here don't have great color vision. But you say you're wondering because they always seem to know which leaves are green. Um, remember, a color blind doesn't necessarily mean you see in black and white. I mean, you, I think it's, Brian, you were saying it's red and green are the yeah. shades, the two shades that they see. Greens and blues. Greens and blues, sorry. Greens and blues, which will make red very difficult to see, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, the, there are different shades of those, and... While I'm sure they do use their sight and they can see the difference between a brown leaf and a red leaf, at least a green leaf, I think it's largely done by feel and smell. Their sense of smell is so much more super, uh, sharp than ours, so much sharper than ours, that I think you'll find that l they largely find those green leaves by a sense of smell. Nice shot of him doing that, isn't it? Oh. Yes. There now. You hear those birds alarm calling? That's quite interesting. I wonder if there isn't a predator in sight somewhere. Karula, like I say, is on Little Gari at the moment. But, of course, we don't need to wait for Karula because Hayden has his own predators to go and see. Ah, at last. We were patient, folks. We were patient. And look at this beautiful intimacy here. <laughs> it's a bit hard to see, but I think this male is going to be overcome by some fierce predators in a minute. They have this little cub stalked his potential dad there please excuse me clicking away folks but uh, it's just been waiting for these guys to to interact and uh, he's just put his head up one of the males and the little cub has just come over so there might be another one coming over in a second you can see the immense Main on this beautiful boy now. And uh, we were talking about mains before, you know, not all, I think there's records of not all male lions having mains. Look at this little guy stalking as well. <laughs> That's very nice. So you can see Dad is starting to yawn. <laughs> he's going to get, he's in trouble, he's got two of these guys now, <laughs> beautiful. Pulling on dad's mane. And he's just handling it. He's like, just that'll that's enough guys. <laughs> really beautiful to watch folks. They've plucked up the courage to uh, come up. And <laughs> We might have um, we might have a couple of the other cubs come over as well. The females have just uh, started to get up, and this is what we said would happen. Uh, you start to get a little bit of a a little bit of uh, interaction. Cubs have come up and woken up Dad. The females are all over on the left now, starting to stir, standing up, yawning yawning while they're laying on their backs. <laughs> that beautiful male's mane in that sunlight is just fantastic. Last rays of sunshine of the afternoon. The 
females have just all gotten up, it's very interesting, all gotten up and all walked off. And they've walked off around the other side of that termite man. You can just see them walking down there now. And we will see if uh, the males follow. Lots of yawning going on, lots of cubs. So I think there's a couple of cubs just walking through there now, Jandre, to the left. And I think those ones are the younger ones by the looks of things to me. They followed mum very quickly, whereas these ones are a little bit more independent. Maybe they're all the same. I'm not sure from here. It's a bit of a broken visual for me. But these three cubs have chosen to stick with uh, potentially who's dad. And this is the one who's stalking his brother. Practicing that stalking behavior. Get down low. Just that natural instinct is beautiful to watch. So it's very hard to for Jandre to see from where, like I can just see around the corner of the termite mound. We cannot move uh, any further forward, of course, and. Uh, the females are all just sitting around the other side of the termite mound, very alert. I can see the black backs of their ears. And keen, this is the time of the night that uh, they would take advantage of any situation that, that uh, presented itself and the other male is coming through now. Now this will be a beautiful thing to watch because these, both of these males should greet each other as well. There'll be a lot of head rubbing and mane rubbing and some beautiful social behavior that we'll see between these two potentially brothers. Uh, you'd never know unless you check their DNA but uh, they are potentially brothers from way back. He's looking directly over where the females are. And I'm just trying to focus on this We've got a question from Kimberly in Florida, and Kimberly, you welcome aboard. You're a first-time viewer, which is fantastic to have you on board. Uh, Kimberly, I'm going to come to your question immediately after this. Oh, no, I thought a male was just about to approach. I'll just get out of the way for Jandre there, but that male was just about to approach his brother. So I thought they were going to do that social interaction. So, your question is, do the youngsters, the little cubs, eat worms? I'm sure if they came across it, uh, a little worm, <laughs> for some reason, they may, may chow it, they may chow down on it, but I am also, uh, I can't say that I've ever seen one. But uh, fantastic to have you on board, and these uh, females could potentially hunt tonight, so you never know what could happen on Safari Live tomorrow morning. Uh, there's a potential that these animals might be on a kill and we'll certainly make sure we keep uh, keep our eyes peeled on that one but at the moment we've got two of the Birmingham males here with us five cubs and four females so I'm not sure where the other cubs are because there's supposed to be eight cubs as far as I'm aware Females are coming back up now, so that's nice. There could be some beautiful interaction between 
the females and the males as well. There's one female just about to walk back up through. So I just got a message from Final Control. Can you just repeat that please, Bex? Okay, I'm not sure who's got this. I've just got a bit of a break up in my signal here, folks, but um, we have something really, really special to cut to. So let's just cross over and we'll come back uh, right now. Now that elephant, everybody, is going down a slope. It's another elephant, obviously. It's not the same. It's a tiny little thing. <laughs> He's inelegantly going down where Karula and the two little ones had a Nyala kill about, what, Brian, about three months ago, maybe. Yeah, no, maybe. not that much. Maybe <laughs> two months ago. And I've named this particular area after the ranger who was driving his guest. I shall not rem mention where he was from or... Oh. Kudu alarm call. But anyway, where that elephant's just gone, this guy said to me, I was parked down the other side, he said, do you think I should come around, or do you think we can just go over the top? So I replied to him, we're going to move quite quickly, there's a kudu alarm calling. I replied to him, um, well, if you come over the top, it will certainly be the very last thing that you ever do in that Land Cruiser. And I thought I was very funny, and so did Brian. There's a kudu alarm calling there, while we race around the corner to see if we can find what's there. Let's go and see the lions again with Hayden. So there's lots of things happening here. The females have come back from around the corner. They may have just gone around to look for something or they're lying back down now. <laughs> they all might have just gone, uh, who knows what it was for, it was out of our vision, but there are definitely a few of them awake. They might not be lying, it's definitely not lying back down to go to sleep, but they might be lying down to suck all the cubs or something, but there's a lot of lovely sort of interaction going on and a lot of yawning. But I do want you to see them come up to the male as well. Because there's some beautiful, very tender social interaction that happens. Must be another one just over there behind us. I'm just listening to other vehicles. <laughs> just got a comment from Susan. A group of cubs should be a cuddle of cubs. Yeah, they are pretty cute, aren't they? But uh, definitely uh, a great name for them, Susan. But yeah, they're very, very cool creatures. And I think... By the looks of things, there seems to be another vehicle over the other side that may be looking at another male. So maybe there's three males here, one that we didn't know about. Um, the, the vegetation is incredibly thick through here, folks, so I do declare it's a bit difficult to see how many lines were actually uh, in our midst. Lots of little play activity going on over the other side there, and the group, the, the pride becoming a little bit more active. The sun has just gone down. We don't have any more sunshine on us whatsoever. So it is at this time where the pride becomes active, starts to stretch, a lot of grooming, a lot of social activity, and then one of the females will just make the decision to go, and off they'll go.
here comes here comes the male now. This is really what we wanted to see, folks. This is what we wanted to see. Let's watch what happens here with these two boys. They'll greet each other. I hope, or maybe not. Maybe there was a bit of a scrap between them but this morning. So he might turn his head back to us and a little little wound on the nose there and that may have been the scuffle this morning we may see a little reconciliation who knows maybe not so Jamie was with them this morning here comes another one of the females to uh, a little bit of a bit of a limp on this boy. Hmm. So that was definitely the two that. Uh, wow. So that just confirmed. Just uh, this one's got a real limp in front of us. So we had a question before about whether there was any injuries from this morning, and if you can see this individual right in front of us, definitely so. Very lame on his front left. Very lame. So isn't that interesting? These boys we've seen before come up and greet each other and do incredible head rubbing and uh, that that really beautiful tender <laughs> care but they're obviously the two that had the scrap this morning so they haven't um they haven't reconciled the situation by any stretch of the imagine imagination i don't know if i've got my head in the way there can you get through to see there's a very difficult to see right behind there is the other male so not the best of friends at this minute. It could have gone either way, uh, but it's probably something that we was a little obvious the way had the distance. It's not always that obvious, but the distance that he was lying away. But he did try and come in there, but uh, that's not great to see. This one, this individual in front of us here. He's got a very, very bad, uh, there's no visual signs to his, I can't see a wound or anything. I'm just going to have a look through my binoculars to see if I can see any, anything. It does look a little bit swollen. Oh uh, yeah, I can see a little puncture. Just on his left front. If you just go to his left front and get that right in the middle of the screen there, Jean-Dre, there's a little sort of spot about maybe three or four, maybe five inches up his leg there. Looks like a little puncture in there. Okay, so we're going to cross back over to James and uh, get an update from him. Uh, interesting, interesting interaction there. Could have gone either way, could have been a reconciled, they could have just not seen each other for a while and had a bit of a main rub and females, etc. But uh, there's obviously still problems afoot and uh, this male, let that male know what was going on. So let's cross over to James and see what he's up to. We'll be back with you just now. Okay, we found the kudu, everybody. They're just behind us. They were looking up sort of towards where we were. So we drove around there. We didn't find anything. Jamie said she had some lion tracks around here earlier today. I don't know if a lion stood up somewhere around. We're just going to go a little bit down the road. But there's, there are no tracks of anything in this area. 
So I think we're going to turn around and go back the way we've come. But if you look to the left of us, if a predator had got up and come across the road here or something like that, it would be very difficult to sort of see where it had gone because of the thickness of the vegetation there. Put our jerseys on. It's starting to get a little bit nippy, isn't it, Brian? It is. Yes, as the sun heads for the western horizon, as it inevitably does. Okay, we're going to move to this. Turn around here, I think, everyone. Hello, Andrew. <laughs> you say, where do I think all the birds are, Andrew? Well, I think the birds... I'm just laughing because of that song, which I shall attempt to remember and sing to you. Uh, the birdies are all around, they're just not calling, and I don't know why they're not calling. And I mean, if we're quiet now, it might be worthwhile just having a listen anyway because of the hooded alarm call, see if anything else is calling. All I can hear is a dove. A green pigeon going... No, Franklin's calling. Nothing like that. Yeah, very, very quiet. It's strange, Andrew. Um, the song or the rhyme goes, Spring has sprung, the grass is whiz, I wonder where the birdies is. The birds is on the wing, but I thought the wing was on the bird. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Brian. At least you liked it. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes. A Twitter applause. Do you think there's some Twitter applause, Brian? I just made up that word. Twitter applause. Yeah. <laughs> Which, of course, tw tw Twitter applause is different from Twitter applause. Debbie from Vancouver, nice idea from you. You say the uh, are the clouds up ahead, are they cirrus clouds up in the sky? Some of them, yes. Probably what we'd call um, strat cirrostratus. Not quite a wispy mains, uh, or wispy mare's mane, but uh, a bit more solid than that. So that's what my guess would be. Do, is there a weather change and could that be chasing the birds away? Well, it's certainly possible, Debbie. In Vancouver, that is a possibility. I don't know what these kudus were shouting at. They may have just been having a domestic argument of some sort. One would expect to find a predator's track were it to have been something that terrified the kudu to the point of wanting to shout. But we don't see anything here. There is a steenbok right here. Wait. Wait, everyone, wait. You will be so amazed when you see where it thinks it is hidden. It may now have moved, of course. Where is it, Brian? I think it's gone. Yes, it has. Um, I'm not really sure what to do. I think we're going to head towards the sunset. It's possible that something walked off towards Treehouse Dam. It could have been Karula. She was to the south. Yeah, but there are no tracks on the road here. I don't know, everyone. I don't know, but we're going to give it a try. And Hayden has managed to find not only the lions today, but also, before us, a sunset. Well, we just pulled out of the siding just for a little bit to let some other people in that just arrived. Uh, and we just pulled back and saw how magnificent this is. My last uh, South African sunset for today, this, this little journey. And it's not bad, is it? Wow, look at those beautiful clouds and what beautiful light on those clouds. And we've got uh, the two males that were over there, they definitely had an interaction but we pulled out just to let uh, another one of the vehicles into that location because it's quite a, quite a nice view there and we might try and find another male because I do think there's three males here but at the moment 
that magnificent sky, that quintessentially gorgeous colour and African sunset. It is just beautiful, isn't it? Really fantastic. So we're just standing by at the moment. We're just sitting here um, letting people have a, a little uh, bit of time with those animals because there wasn't any pressure before. There was, we were the only vehicle there and there was no other people uh, coming around. But at this time on the way back, people uh, knew that um, there would be, uh, be more people around. So we're going to let them have it and take over. So the females moved off into the bush, uh, into, the, into the sunset, so to speak. <laughs> Uh, yeah, go ahead. Just pulling back a little bit right here, uh -huh. but we might just wait because Andrew actually, I let, came out to let Andrew in and he's decided it might have been a bit tight for him. So I'm just going to pull back a little bit more. Uh, we moved out of a spot that was just uh, down in this, this really, really dense vegetation here, but we found a little track in and then we uh, let, went to let one of the other cars, the vehicles in, but our vehicle is so tiny and it turns on a 20 cent piece. We could maneuver in and out of the vegetation, whereas uh, the longer extended vehicles, they find it a bit tricky sometimes to get into those really tight spots. Nonetheless, we always, always offer, it's all about sharing these beautiful encounters with uh, everyone around and all the guests that are on these reserves it's really important that people have that wow factor, that incredible moment where they've seen either their first line or another line uh, in their life. You never forget, it is being in the presence of that magnificent beast. It is absolutely magic, Sunny. Uh, a beautiful sunset, no, absolutely incredible, gorgeous colours. Jandre is doing beautiful work there, picture, picking out the really charismatic trees and just it all, all of it adds together. Um, just please stand by, folks. I just want to let Aubrey know. Uh, Orbs, right? Just in, down in here, you've got two and then uh, another one just here. Okay, it's a little bit tight, Orbs. It's just right just here and in. Um, just sharing that uh, sighting with these guys. But I think, folks, you know what? We, uh, they're, they're moving into the bush, and um, I think we're going to reverse out of here. We've had a, a lovely, lovely time. Even though the, the visuals were quite difficult, uh, it's still being in the presence of them. And as I said, there was no pressure on us to go. We wouldn't normally stay at a sighting that long, but no one else uh, was coming. Uh, to join so we didn't feel like we needed to move but then I heard on the radio a couple of vehicles wanted to come so that's why we're, we're moving off but wasn't that interesting how those two males interacted then uh, there was I thought there was a potential that they might have not seen each other for a while and uh, come up and did that beautiful interaction where they rub manes together but they were definitely not happy with each other and they must have been, I, I'm pretty sure I'd say 100% that they were the two that had the scrap this morning with Jamie, uh, but one of them has come off worse for wear. One's got a little nick on his nose, which isn't, there's nothing, you know, most lions have lots of scars all over their faces from fighting, but the other one's very, very lame, got a very, very sore left front foot, so I'm sure the team will pick that up tomorrow morning and, and find out what's gone on there. Right. We're going to just carry on. We've got about 20 minutes left, and I'm going to cross back over to James and see what he's up to. He's sure to have something fantastic. He always does. Incredible man and uh, wonderful, wonderful person to be around. Learn so much from James. Let's see what he's up to. Just a silent look at the sunset, everyone.
<laughs> mainly because Brian said something ridiculous as we came live, and <laughs> I got the giggles. Isn't that pretty? Brian still has the giggles. It's very still, Brian. I'm surprised it's not shaking up and down. <laughs> I think it's so lovely. We've given up on whatever it was that made those kudu shout, everyone. We've come back down to the western sector of Juma, and maybe we'll be lucky with some shadow tracks. Maybe Maybe some Sindila tracks, a stick just attacked Brian, everyone, don't worry, he beat it off, fearlessly, well done Brian. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll be blessed with some Tingana tracks even, he's who I'd quite like to see today. <laughs> Sorry, I have to do this again everyone, I'm unable to drive past this scene. I think Hayden's got his bat detector with him, and I've just seen a bat flying about. So hopefully he'll be able to find it. And I am definitely going to try and get hold of one of those bat detectors. And I'm going to ask Brian to pan slowly to the left. Well done, Brian. That was very intuitive of you. It's like you're psychic. And in the wa far west, the Drakensberg Mountains bathed in a kind of dirty copper. Would you say, Brian? And there, the hills of Ulusaba. That's where Richard Branson has his little spot. A full line of these granite copies, of, as we call them, or rocky outcrops, that exploded out of some fissure in the ground, leaving a line all the way up to uh, the Sand River. A line of these rocky outcrops many millions of years ago. Before, Brian, you and I were even a twinkle in our mother's eyes. There's the bat, everyone. Brian is now tracking a bat. If you are prone to seasickness, please close your eyes. That's very smooth, bat tracking, Brian. The, b the best bat tracking, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Right, one last look at that unbelievable light. Look at that. Oh, it's stunning. And on we go. And on we go. It really is quite spectacular. Hello, Angela in Botswana. Thank you very much for your question. I'm just waiting to find out what it was. Um, Angela, you say, if a kudu barks, could it be a social dispute? Um, I, I don't want to say no completely. I'm going to hedge my bets a little bit and t say I don't think so. I think it's highly unlikely. That bark is very much an alarm call, and they do that because they want to tell each other and warn each other that there's a predator around. They could have heard something. They could have smelt something. They could have... I don't know, I mean, they could have even smelled us when we were with those elephants. It really wasn't too far from them. So, I don't know, it could have been something like that. But I think it's highly unlikely they would have barked at each other, unless there was a major conflict, perhaps, between two bulls, and they were a little bit worried about the, the consequences of something like that. I'm not sure. It's a good question, though. Thank you, all the way from Botswana. Wonderful to have you with us. I wonder where, Angela, where in Botswana are you? I can't imagine you're in the delta. You'd be uh, looking for your own animals. The devastation of this dry season continues. And I don't mean the devastation in a negative way. I'm not sure you can say devastation in a particularly positive way. But if you just look around us, it's so open now. And although, as Brent said, some of the animals can be a little bit under pressure, um, because of the drought, it does mean that when you're on walk, you can see miles into the bush, which is very helpful if you're finding an animal that's under pressure. Not so, Brian. Yes. <laughs> Let's 
see what we can find around the corner here. There's a nice big clearing. Perhaps some impalas will have come into the clearing. Oh, color. Oh, Brian, you say is that the God's Window Valley that we were looking into there? Um, I'm just trying to think how far to the west that... Yeah, we would have gone past it. We certainly, I think, by the end of that pan, we were too far south. And at the start, we were too far north. It's in the middle of that. But in the middle of that, you can see a kind of valley like that. And that is where the Blader River Canyon is. And just to the south of that position is where God's Window is. And God's Window, everybody, is the most unbelievable view. If you can ever come into this, come into this area, you go along and you can drive along the top of the mountains there and you go and you walk to the edge of God's wind and it really is, it's unbelievable. You can see all the way into Mozambique from up there. Right, Hayden uh, is not going to make you seasick. He has a slightly more effective method of showing you the bats. Go and take a look. Well, Hardida Ibis. Correct, Chandra? Yeah. That was <laughs> Chandra was doing a uh, a bend over there to try and get that shot. Uh, that call is very, very distinctive. But we just thought we'd stop here because we talked about those three dr trees as we were driving past, and just thought they look absolutely spectacular with that sky behind. It's too beautiful to go past. And you know what? We we don't. Sunsets, I mean, African sunsets are beautiful every day, but you get some that with cloud always gives you this incredible intensity and change of light uh, and reflection. And oh, it's just magic, isn't it? Uh, and I just thought while we're here, we might uh, have a little, little listen to some bats if there's any around. Now, I found I, I won't turn it on right away, but I found uh, I do apologize, I haven't done my research on my. Uh, African or Southern African bats because I wasn't expecting to bring this little uh, bat detector with me and I just grabbed it and I thought I'll just test it out there. I actually didn't know if there would be any bats uh, active at this time of the year here but it's so mild and that has actually happened in Australia and it does happen sometimes in the United Kingdom when we're around there. If it's a mild s winter uh, they will actually stay out longer before they go into either a a dormant uh, period through the winter. So we just thought we'd bring it out, but I found this little uh, chart on the on the internet about South African call parameters of some Southern African bats, and it gives you the uh, durations in milliseconds and the range in kilohertz and the dominant frequency, which is the one that we're after. We're really after that dominant frequency. And you know what? It's a little bit of guesswork unless you're a super bat expert uh, which I'm not. I find it as a hobby. I love it. It's a good bit of fun. It's great with kids. But it also teaches you that bats are really, really important. Microbats are nocturnal and they rely on their echolocation uh, and to a lesser extent their eyesight to find their way and locate insects at night. So it's really, really important that um, we know that it's not just the big things as we always say. It's the little things as well. So what Jean-Dre and I are doing at the moment is looking for one right there. Isn't that great? Now that's quite a low, quite a low frequency there. And I'm, I'm actually well tracked, Andre. Look at that, flying through the sky. I'll get him when he comes back around to me. But I'll just turn that down a little bit. He's coming back around. The frequencies, the ones that I'm looking at. I'll just show you quickly. I'll just pull this up while Andre's tracking that and get it up on here for you. There's all these different species. That's amazing tracking, Jandre. That is not easy, folks, what Jandre's doing there, right? Tracking a micro bat through the sky. <laughs> wow. Isn't he beautiful? Using his echolocation to hunt, and that is a really beautiful thing. Echolocation is the technique that they use uh, for bats to see their way through their environment, basically. So, as Jandre's tracking that little bat, he is hunting and using a, f a, uh, a, a pulse of really, really high frequency, uh, high-pitched sounds, which are 
normally frequencies is well, well beyond. And while, oh, look, that's great, John Day. That's really great to show everyone. You can see how he's dodging and darting through the sky there. Absolutely beautiful. Now, there are a range of, of frequencies that are well, well beyond the frequencies uh, that human can, humans can hear. So it's um, one of those things that we have to, some bright spark came up with this uh, idea to create a bat detector. And we're just going to watch this little guy because he's quite a ways away from us. But when he comes closer, I'll grab it and you can hear, oh, there's a couple of little ones maybe coming around. Beautiful. So the noise, the actual frequency is emitted from their, their nostrils and their mouth and it comes back to their ears and it basically gives them a soundscape uh, of what's going on and when they get that information back into their ears, they, there he is. So I'm going to just pop it up to one of the ones that I think it could potentially be. What we've got here a list of bats. I'm not sure which ones actually occur here, and I do apologise. I will do more research next time. But we have horseshoe bats here. We also have uh, uh, freetail bats here, and tomb bats, I think, as well. I uh, can't see any on this particular list. It's not. This is not extensive by any uh, realm of the imagination. But it's got a scientific name, and it's also got a bit of other information. So. I won't bore you with that, but let's have a listen, and I'll put it on a frequency that I think might, they might, we might pick one up, which is a, a pretty common frequency. It's about 45, 45 kilohertz. Lots of these little guys, they're not just quite close enough. We got one before. Bear with us, folks, just be, have the pay look at the sky, enjoy the bats whilst I oh yeah just not coming close to us enough. So I move up a bit on Jeandre. It seemed to be more active just there. Folks, I'm just going to move up around that tree because they seem to be more active just around that tree just there and above that water. Now, I'm sure a bat expert, if a bat expert is listening, uh, that particular species is hanging around that little, that little uh, water point, Viatella pan there. And that could be a characteristic uh, of the bat that it hunts over water. Some species do or they'll be looking uh, to try and hunt insects around that area. So let's just stop a little bit further up and we might get some really cracking sounds here. It's quite fun and I have to say it's fantastic to do with kids. We've got a question from Julia Smith here. Do bats eat on the wing or do they have to land? They do eat on the wing. Oh, this is good. Julia, I'm coming back to you, I promise. Oh, how cool. We have got so many here. Isn't that brilliant? Oh, listen to all the difference. So that is the echolocation. Julia, I'm coming back to your promise. Isn't that just fantastic? So those little... Looks like there's two different species here, actually. That's a much smaller bat. Did you see that? That was really interesting. Did you hear when it does that little... That one there, that John Dre's on, over the water point, when it catches something, it does a really great series of really quick ones. Absolute bat heaven here tonight, folks. We've 
I've got about 15 of these little guys out. Whoa. Julia, to answer Julia's... Julia, I do apologise. I just got so sidetracked. Fantastic. One just swooped over the car as well. Julia, um, do apologise for that. I just got overwhelmed by this incredible bat frenzy. So they do eat on the wing. Some species uh, that can catch much bigger prey will uh, attach themselves to a tree or something and devour their meal. But most of them do eat on the wing. And some species uh, have been thought to eat potentially like 8,000 small insects a night in one sitting. That's pretty incredible. And they are incredibly important uh, animals in our ecosystem. So it's a, it's a bit of fun. Well, folks, I'm going to sign off. And uh, I just want to make it really quick because I can, you know, I can talk. Uh, I've got a lot of just lovely, lovely comments coming through from uh, Final Control saying people are wishing they're giving me their best wishes and thank you for coming back. Look, folks, you don't have to thank me for coming back. It's an absolute pleasure. I can do this. <laughs> I just love doing this. So I hopefully will be back again sometimes in the f future. Who knows when that might be. But at the, be the best thing that I can say to you is that I just want to take my hat off to the Safari Live team, an incredible group of people absolutely amazing to work with and I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart these this team that we've got here is like no one else I've ever worked with anywhere on the planet in TV it is the most incredible thing to work with these guys the wildlife of course it's beautiful the location South Africa I love you it is absolutely amazing but this team on Safari Live is rock and roll it's unbelievable thank you so much thank you so much for uh, listening to the school shows as well hopefully we've changed a lot a lot of uh, students uh, uh, directions or given them a really great injection of enthusiasm and optimism about the planet. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand back to James to do a magnificent closing with this sunset. It's been an absolute pleasure, folks. Thank you for having me. Thank you for putting up with me, my mistakes, my f forgetfulness. And uh, yeah, you never know what's around the next corner. We'll see you soon. It has just been so wonderful for two reasons, this drive. Well, I mean, I'm now getting tongue-tied. We've had an unbelievable sighting of the young bull on the far left-hand side of where you were. If you look down here, Brian will just show you how close that animal was. That is a metre away. He sat and he ate that branch a metre away. I, if I open the... Mm, I'm not going to. I could open the door and retrieve it. That's how close he was. He just sat there. He didn't even pay any attention. He just looked at us. Now, it is, of course, World Elephant Day tomorrow. And somewhere in the world, it's probably World Elephant Day today. Um, possibly we had a comment from Adelaide today on our Facebook Live broadcast. And definitely in Fiji, I'm sure it's tomorrow. So at least you've had all the elephants for this uh, for the start of World Elephant Day. We're, Brian and I are terrified that after all the elephants today, we're not going to have any tomorrow on World Elephant Day. A reminder to you that we're going to stick with these times, 6 to 9 in the mornings. And because, that's, you know, we've shifted for these school drives with Hayden, and I think it works quite nicely, so that's what we're going to do. Well, everyone thinks it works quite nicely, not just me. Steve Foster... You're a new viewer. Thank you for watching us. And you say, are we in the Kruger? We most certainly are in the Kruger. We're on the Western Fringes. Uh, the Sabi Sand, a collection of private game reserves. And the little one we're on now is called Juma. And that's a little herd of elephants. I'm not going to put a light on them. You can see it's, it's got quite dark there. There they are. And we've just got a minute left. So while Brian tries to find the elephants for the last time, I just want to say a huge thank you to Hayden Turner for coming all the way from Sydney, Australia to see us. It's been wonderful to have him with us and we wish him bon voyage tomorrow. I think he's going back to Namibia to guide a safari and then back home to his wee boy and his wife Nina and Jack and we're hoping that they will come and see us again sometime soon. I hope they're watching. Nina and Jack, thanks for lending Hayden to us and send him back here again, please. Thank you, Brian, for your efforts Thanks. today. Very nice, beautiful Olympic thumb that you had there. Huge thanks to Rebecca and to Geraldine in the final control. And, of course, to all of you for joining us. It's been a wonderful, chatty afternoon, so thank you for that. We'll join you. See you tomorrow, 6 o'clock on World Elephant Day. Bye-bye.